I am going to revisit the hoof mechanism, the, the, the knowledge that we have, which I have here, is a flexible piece of material. We know from the way we shoe horses, the way we look at the foot, the way we measure it, that the heels expand and contract, the sole drops a little bit, and other parts of the hoof change in their shape. So I'm going to revisit that. And when did we, as uh, carers of the horse's foot, when did we first start to appreciate this? Well, it was a long time ago. I'm going to ask these questions, and this presentation will address these four points. So the first point is, is the hoof mechanism important? And at what level of the circulation of the blood does it operate? Does it operate regardless of what we do to the bottom of the foot, regardless of what shoe, what apparatus we apply to the bottom of the foot? What would happen to the horse's foot if we abolished the hoof mechanism? So I hope to answer those four questions. I think we all agree that the hoof mechanism exists. The hoof capsule is not a solid cast iron piece of material. It's flexible, we know that. It deforms during the cyclic loading of the foot. With each stride, with each slight movement that the horse makes, the hoof is changing in its shape. It's responding to the small changes the quasi-static loading of the horse. When the horse turns to the left, the weight changes a little bit and things change inside the foot. And during, as we saw yesterday, during the mid-stance phase of even the gallop of the horse, the middle phalanx drops between the cartilages between the heels of the foot, between the cartilages, and the middle phalanx is almost parallel with the ground. So there are large changes to the horse's foot. The changes in the phalangeal bones um, drives the heels apart. And we sometimes see this in the metal of the shoe as parts of the shoe are worn away by the mechanism of the hoof. And in summary, the the dorsal hoof wall collapses inwards, the heels are dri driven apart, and the sole does descend into the hoof capsule. And as far back as 1891, the German veterinary scientist Lungfitz drew, created this diagram, in which we still see this diagram today. We see the dorsal hoof wall dropping inwards, we see the coronary band, the hoof part of the coronary band descending downwards, and we see the heels expanding and becoming a little bit lower. And I, in my curiosity about the horse's foot, I investigated this with a series of radiographs. And I've turned this radiograph into a morphic uh, video. And I want you to see now a maximum load applied to the cadaver limb and watch the changes, the deformation of the hoof capsule. So now the load is being applied and not much is changing, but quite suddenly you'll see the dorsal hoof wall changing in its position. If we run that again, we see that the distal phalanx also moves at the end of the cycle. It goes downwards. The palmar aspect of the distal phalanx is also descending. Now, I've truly measured the sole thickness here. <clears throat> uh, a lot of people measure the sole thickness from the tip of the distal phalanx to the ground surface, but that's not a true measurement of sole thickness. You have to put some contrast actually on the sole to measure the true sole depth. 
I've made a series of uh, photographs here, and this is the, the pink outline is the original position of the distal phalanx, and the pink line here is the original position. So you can see that the dorsal hoof wall has moved inwards, the distal phalanx has moved downwards, the tip of the distal phalanx has moved downwards a little bit, and the sole has dropped. So you can easily demonstrate this with a series of radiographs. This is completely normal function of the horse's foot. And I put it to you that uh, we've been uh, nailing on horseshoes for hundreds of years. Millions of horses have been shod with shoes. And although we are taught that the, the nails of the shoe must not be further palmer, further behind than the middle of the hoof wall, uh, I wonder about that. We're told that this allows the hoof mechanism to operate and that nailing behind the widest part of the foot is detrimental. Is that really true? We've been nailing shoes for hundreds of years, millions of horses, and there's no direct pathology from nailing shoes on. And even if we apply a rim shoe, which I have done in uh, my practice, uh, a rim shoe that uh, uh, goes completely around the uh, the distal margin of the hoof wall, it does no harm. This has been applied for a fracture of the distal phalanx and it's been on for several months. No direct consequences. So in 1891, the, the, the hoof mechanism occupied the minds of farriers and veterinarians for many decades, many hundreds of years. And both Lugwitz and Frederick Smith in England uh, explored the hoof mechanism, tried to prove that it exist, existed. And they came to the same conclusions, one in Germany and one in England, at the same time, at the same, in the same year. And uh, uh, Professor Lungwitz, he uh, devised an electronic apparatus, which was uh, very uh, advanced for its day. This is the beginning of the experiment. This is the uh, end of the experiment. And as the, as the um, hoof uh, capsule m moved in its flexibility, the circuits were connected and a bell rang. So he was able to prove that the heels expanded and the dorsal hoof wall uh, sunk into the hoof capsule. Frederick Smith did the same thing, but he had a device that actually measured the distance. Um, my pointer doesn't seem to want to work. But he measured the actual distance, and he measured it in fractions of an inch. So they both proved the heels expanded and the other deformations of the hoof wall occurred. And later, they probably fought against each other in the First World War because uh, Frederick Smith was a major general in the war and fought in Europe in the First World War. But he said something that really surprised me. So writing in 1891, he, he wrote something when I looked through his uh, material, his, uh, his book that he published, he, he, he wrote something that I thought I had discovered just a few years ago, that the amount of blood in the horse's foot is uh, as big as the amount of blood in the horse's brain. I measured the glucose concentration uh, in the horse's foot and how glucose was consumed by the metabolism of the tissues within the foot, and more glucose is consumed by one foot than is consumed in the brain of the horse. And Frederick Smith came to the same conclusions in 1891. And indeed, there is a large amount of blood inside the horse's foot. 90% of it is in the veins, of course. The uh, picture on the left is only the arteries, but you can see with this vascular cast of plastic that there is a large amount of blood, but most of that is in the venous system. So the hoof mechanism proposes that this expansion and contraction of the heels, ever so slight sometimes, but large with the maximum uh, load during the uh, fast gallop, that the movements are entrained with the hoof cycle. 
And is this important? And everybody has concluded that it's important because it's involved in the circulation of the blood through the foot. And we followed this uh, line of thought by cannulating the artery of a horse's foot, of a horse's leg, and then going through the load cycle. And we're delivering uh, blood in the form of saline, dyed blue, and we're cyclically loading the horse's foot. And you can see in the video that when we load the foot, there is a uh, outflow of uh, there is an outflow of blood from the venous system during the load. The arterial system is constantly uh, supplying the fluid, but with each load cycle, the veins inside the inside the foot and up the leg are uh, contracting. Um, without any muscular contraction, I might add. And uh, we go back now to 1851, where the great uh, French scientist uh, uh, Henri-Marie Boulet, in 1851, suggested that the horse's foot was actually an additional heart. And there was, as we just demonstrated, a cyclic uh, sucking phase where the blood is pulled out of the foot by the mechanism of the foot and the, the bones compressing the soft tissues within the hoof capsule, the flexible hoof capsule, allowing this expansion and contraction. And there was a pushing, uh, a pulling phase when the heart is delivering blood to the horse's foot. And of course, there are no valves inside the horse's foot. Uh, the first valve is in the pastern, so blood can move anywhere within the, within, under the hoof capsule. It can, move in any direction, through the, up to the coronary band, across the sole, between the ungual cartilages. Every foot contraction moves the blood and brings it up the leg. But there's a point here. If the arteries are delivering blood, and this enormous load cycle is pushing blood up through the veins, why isn't the blood back flowing up through the arteries? And Boulay assumed that the contraction of the heart and the uh, 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 blood delivery through the arteries was sufficient to stop backflow. But backflow is very important. A pump can't work if the valves are leaking, if blood is going backwards and forwards. There's no effective pump. So in, even in 1851, they were using rubber latex to produce casts of the horse's foot. And I'm amazed at the quality of this uh, over 100 years ago. And this is a 3D uh, model of the veins of the horse's foot uh, that we filled with contrast medium. And they're almost exactly the same. So the question is, does turbulent backflow occur when the horse is galloping, when this enormous load, uh, acceleration forwards, uh, load from above, the ground reaction force squeezing the tissues, is there backflow? We need to address this and, and discover whether it's true or not. And it was a farrier who first explained this to us, a farrier in South Africa called von Kreienberg. In 1882, he injected into live horses contrast medium when the horse's foot was relaxed. And then he loaded the foot by lifting the other leg and injected the contrast medium again. And he showed for the first time that there was a, a ablation of blood flow to the foot when the foot was at that maximum loaded stance. And I repeated that in our laboratory with our, our, our 3D contrast studies. And what we discovered, if I can show you now the uh, arteries of the horse's foot uh, with this um, so we used angiography and we used um, our CT machine to scan the blood vessels and the bones. And uh, we come to the conclusion, or the, the video, please. I can't, don't seem to be able to make this. Oh, here we go. Now I'm taking away the bones so that you can see the palmar and the palmar arteries, uh, 
medial one here, lateral one there. And inside the bone, protected by the hard bone, is this vital terminal arch. So the, the two arteries, medial and lateral, meet inside the bone, protected by the bone, and deliver blood vessels that go through the surf surface of the bone, through these parietal arteries, and they form the, uh, they form the circumflex artery outside the bone. So when we did this study with an unloaded foot, we got a complete uh, picture of the circulation. But when we loaded the foot, we got uh, surprising results. And we were able to confirm von Kreienberg's early studies. So during the load, there are occlusions of the artery. You can see them just on either side of the navicular bone here. And that's exactly where the deep flexor tendon inserts on the distal phalanx. So during the load cycle, during the load cycle, the, where the arteries enter the distal phalanx through the um, foramen here to form the uh, solar canal, the artery comes in through that hole, forms the terminal arch inside the bone, but during the load cycle, the pressure of the deep flexor tendon on the uh, edges of the distal phalanx cut off the arterial blood supply. And you can see in this image that there is no blood entering that foot during the maximum load. So for a period, with every load cycle, there is a, a, a period where no blood is entering the horse's foot. And this prevents the surge of blood back up through the arteries. So when the foot is lifted again, of course, the pressure of the, of the heart in the arteries, the systolic blood pressure, refills the horse foot with fresh blood. And it's delivered, and then the veins take it away. So, what is the function of this uh, vascular system of the horse's foot? It has one absolutely essential function, and that is to deliver energy to the lamellae, to the attachment apparatus, the suspensory apparatus of the distal phalanx. The apparatus of the uh, epidermal lamellae demands glucose every second of the horse's life. The lamellae, to remain firmly attached, to the suspensory apparatus of the distal phalanx have to have a supply of energy, and that's what the circulation does. So the arteries from the heart come down the leg into the foot, and they do nothing until they reach the capillary bed of the circulation. And it's only in the capillaries that glucose is able to be released, transferred across the membranes of the capillaries into the basal cells where attachment and uh, attachment of the cells to each other and to their basement membrane and to the corium are maintained. So I have uh, this video to show if I click. So I've drawn the suspensory apparatus there as lines. Uh, this is elastic tissue going up to the lamellae and the dorsal hoof wall. But if that system fails, we have descent of the distal phalanx onto the solar corium and the pain of laminitis that we're so familiar with. My next lecture will go into this with more detail. So this filling and uh, emptying of the circulation of the horse's foot is occurring every few seconds of the horse's life. With every stride, with every small movement, the horse can stand still for a long period of time, and there's small massaging uh, movements going on to, from the distal phalanx on the soft tissues. But, and, and so we were able to agree with uh, Professor Henri Marie Boulet from 1851, that there is this cyclic uh, exchange of blood within the horse's foot. So the actual epidermal lamellae have no blood supply of their own. They depend on the adjacent corium, dermis, for 
the blood to be delivered to the capillaries for the glucose to be diffused out of the blood vessels into the actual cells where, it, where it's needed. And the capillaries are extremely close to the target, the epidermal lamellae. And the epidermal lamellae and the suspensory apparatus is the life support system of the horse. Without a functional foot, the horse is uh, virtually useless, if you think in an evolutionary sense. And the arteries and veins are just tubes, conduits, to deliver the blood to the epidermal interface. Glucose, absolutely essential to maintain the connections between the connective tissue of the suspensory apparatus and those epidermal basal cells. And the delivery system is very, very rapid. Within two milliseconds, all of the glucose in the capillary has been transferred across to the cell. So it's happening every second of the horse's life in front of your very eyes. Without that uh, supply of blood sugar, the epidermis disintegrates and we have laminitis. So this diagram is one that I've uh, prepared and it's uh, published in this book, uh, The Illustrated Horse's Foot. And what it shows is the arteries delivering the blood to arterioles and here is the capillary network. The capillaries only exist between the secondary epidermal lamellae. They're in the secondary dermal lamellae. There are no other capillaries within the horse's foot except a few small ones for the bone and for a couple of other pieces of tissue, but the vast majority, 99% of the capillaries are there between the lamellae to maintain the suspensory apparatus of the distal pharynx. And when the glucose has been delivered, capillaries drain the, the, the used blood back into the veins and away back to the heart. So here is the glucose being delivered. I've shaded it in yellow. And this is constant throughout the, throughout the horse's life. Now, we've seen the start, stop, pump mechanism working at the gross level, arteries and veins. Is the same thing happening at the capillary level where the energy is being delivered, where it's absolutely essential? Uh, Boulet, in 1851, he thought that it was the systolic blood pressure that was preventing backflow and pushing the blood to the capillary network. But is that really true? We've used a, a research technique called microdialysis. We can put a small probe in between the lamellae and pump a salt solution into that system where it is absorbed. Anything that is in the lamellar circulation will be picked up. Anything that is not in the lamellar tissues that the fluid in the delivery system is delivering will be removed. So we can measure in and out and concentrations of what's happening within the horse's foot simply by this technique. And we can do it in real time. So we can measure directly how much glucose is being absorbed and how much of the circulation is dilated. And the one thing that made the capillary circulation between those lamellae activated was a few steps, walking the horse, caused uh, blood circulation to be enormously improved. And this shows a decrease in the concentration of something that was being delivered. So when the concentration of that substance, it happened to be urea, was, con was uh, rapidly reduced, it meant that the blood was taking it away. So circulation had improved. And that coincided with walking. As soon as we made the horse walk, glucose of the blood supply rapidly increased. And the other thing that was happening at the same time was that the glucose was being delivered. So the extra requirements of walking were delivered by the capillary circulation. If we put a tourniquet on, the blood glucose rapidly decreased as it was consumed and no more was delivered, and lactic acid started to accumulate. So we learned those things by microdialysis. 
So with each step, even the lamella tips and the secondary epidermal lamellae are moving. And if you look at this crude video, this is an early one, I hope to improve this, you can see blood vessels opening and closing in the secondary dermal lamellae and in the dermis itself. So that cycle is happening at the capillary level. Now, by accident, a few months ago, we uh, uh, discovered just how important that capillary movement of blood is. We thought that uh, we could prevent laminitis in a surgical way by inserting screws from the outside of the hoof on a metal plate that was attached to the hoof through into the bone to stop the bone sinking during laminitis. I am convinced that the major pathology of laminitis is descent of the distal phalanx into the hoof capsule. The, when laminitis occurs, the suspensory apparatus compromised allows the distal phalanx to sink onto the sole, sink onto the sole, and it's the pressure of the margin of the distal phalanx the margin of the distal phalanx on the sole that is so painful. So we did that experiment uh, to try to prevent experiment, experimental laminitis. But first, we did it on some normal horses. And these, this is what happened. Here's the screw plate. You can see that it's got three holes for screws and uh, more holes here. So we, we put screws through that plate into the, into the distal phalanx and it held the bone securely. I don't have uh, the details of the experiment here, but I can assure you that uh, that bone cannot move inside that hoof, cap hoof capsule. And we thought that that was going to be to make the bone secure, so when we induce laminitis, we could let the disease process pass through the horse, and then a few days later, we can take the plate off, and the horse will be perfectly fine. So this is an experimental approach to laminitis. But we did it on these normal horses first. And after two days, you might think that putting those screws into the bone would be painful. It was not. They were very comfortable. We did it under local anesthesia. We did some under general anesthesia. When they woke up, we gave them some pain relief for two days, some antibiotics in case there was infection. And those horses were walking normally with only one foot with the plate attached. We called it fixation of the distal phalanx, FDP, and they were quite comfortable. We euthanized those horses humanely at seven days to look at the lamellae. And I was expecting those lamellae to look perfect. But to my horror or surprise, they were not normal. All the lamellae of those horses that had their distal phalanx fixed had exactly the same lamella pathology as horses with laminitis. Now remember I said there was no pain, but the lamellae were in a catastrophic situation. They were severely pathologically compromised. This is what normal lamellae look like. And this, uh, the no normal appearance of lamellae is to have a nice rounded tip. The purple line around the edges is the basement membrane. This is the connective tissue. You can see the capillaries here between the, in the secondary dermal lamellae, delivering their glucose to all of the epidermal basal cells. So this is the primary epidermal lamellae, the lamellae you can see with the naked eye, and this is attached to the hoof wall. And this material is attached to the distal phalanx. But this is what it looked like after seven days of having the distal phalanx fixed. We did something that damaged the horse severely. Uh, but there's one essential difference between this sort of pathology and the, the pathology we get when we induce laminitis with insulin and the laminitis we induce by giving the horse colitis with an overload of fructan. One singular difference, and that is that there is death of cells down here deep between the epidermal lamellae. We've killed cells. But you can see uh, uh, this is the normal appearance of the uh, lamellae using a technique to discover which cells are alive and which cells are dead. You can see the outline of the normal secondary epidermal lamellae, the SEL, 
But when we looked at the tissues that had had their distal phalanx fixed for seven days, these green cells are all of the dead cells. And it's showing massive destruction, a death and destruction of the cells. Here, are the, here is the base membrane, well separated. So we have did something spectacular to these horses. This is, uh, this is laminitis if we induce it with uh, colitis from overload of uh, carbohydrate. This is, uh, and, and that could be the same with our insulin induction model. The only other model that has death of cells, as we demonstrated with the fixation of the distal phalanx, is our model where we induce laminitis by keeping one foot supporting the weight of the horse for more than 36, 48 hours. That's called our supporting limb laminitis model. We have a model for that, it's not even published yet, where we can demonstrate that a horse not able to move its foot for a long period of time will develop laminitis. As you know, horses can develop supporting limb laminitis and it's usually catastrophic. So at some time point during that process of having the distal phalanx fixed, we compromised the circulation to the point where cells died. So what we've, in a roundabout way, proved that this uh, um, removal of the normal hoof mechanism, this abolition of the normal process, even works at the capillary level, and it's vitally important that uh, this happens. We know from early experiments that if we take away the glucose of lamellae, they separate. And uh, I'm happy to say that uh, my wife, Sandy, and I did this experiment uh, way back in about 1992, where we demonstrated uh, with this video that we demonstrated with this video that if we withdraw glucose from the support fluid of lamellae in tissue culture, that they separate. It takes about 24 hours, 48 hours for this to happen, but it's a complete separation. The lamella tissues are vitally dependent on the supply of glucose, and it's the capillaries that deliver the glucose. So the hoof mechanism, uh, we have now supplied fresh evidence that uh, Professor Henri Marie Boulet in 1851 here in France uh, we've been able to support his hypothesis from, what, 180 years ago. The hoof mechanism doesn't just operate at the vein and artery level, it operates right down to the finest elements of the circulation, the capillary bed, that vital bed that supplies the essential glucose to maintain the suspensory apparatus uh, at the lamella epidermal dermal interface. Even the finest capillaries depend on, on that sometimes subtle cyclic loading, when the horse is standing still, looking around, going to sleep, and even galloping. The finest capillaries rely on that cycle. The arteries and veins exist to supply the blood, but it's the capillaries that do the job. So I'd like to uh, paraphrase this uh, very important uh, saying that uh, Lorenzo mentioned before, for the want of the foot, the horse was lost. I want to change that to, for the want of a hoof mechanism, the foot was lost. So uh, this is one last look at the capillary bed. And it's a, a photograph that amazed me when I made it. What I've done is I've injected the arterial circulation with a very uh, fine mixture of uh, acrylic liquid, and it has uh, particles, pigment particles, 
in the liquid mixture. And you can see that the pigment is clearly visible in the, in the veins here. This is the veins that you see on a venogram in the sublamellar plexus. And the arteries are the smaller vessels running between them. This is the surface of the bone, which I have removed. It shows you how vital the surface of the distal phalanx is, the holes in the surface of the bone supplying blood to the capillary bed. This is the capillary bed, and it's, it's so dense and fine that the pigment particles can't even penetrate those very small, fine blood vessels. And it's like a, a, a bed of, say, I don't know, cotton wool, um, the very, very fine fibres all delivering their glucose. So to answer those four questions that we started this presentation with, is the hoof mechanism important? Yes, of course it is. At what level of the circulation does it operate? arteries and veins that we know of, we can easily demonstrate that, but it's also operating at the capillary level, the vital delivery system of the horse's circulation. I think it operates whatever type of shoe you put on. As long as that middle phalanx can move up and down, it doesn't matter what you put on the bottom of the foot, a rim shoe, nailed on shoe, glue shoe, barefoot, doesn't matter. And what happens if the hoof mechanism is abolished, lamella pathology, and we've managed to do that. Now, this saying, this is me riding, you can see that I have a black beard in this photograph, and uh, I'm riding my favorite horse, uh, and I love this saying from a famous Englishman, uh, Winston Churchill, that time spent in the saddle is never wasted, and that is so true. <laughs> 